Okay. Um, for those of you who do the Bible reading with us, this morning we were in John chapter 3, and uh, we all love John 3, I hope. Um, but it was, it, was, it was the end of the chapter where uh, John the Baptist was baptizing people, and some of his disciples are like, hey, he, uh, that Jesus is baptizing, and people are going to him rather than you, and almost like expecting John to be bothered by that, and John's like, no, this actually makes my joy complete. He says, this is what I wanted. Like, this, is, this isn't like, oh, no, they're not coming to me. They're going to Jesus. He goes, you, you understand, I'm thrilled about this. This makes my joy complete. And that, that verse just jumped out at me this morning thinking, wow, he's saying That's makes my, that makes my joy complete. See, that is the hope of these three weeks here together and explaining the body and blood of Jesus is I have a dream that one day people will be excited, thrilled, not because of who's teaching or who's leading worship. Like this would make my joy complete is if there were homes all around our area where people were flooding there going, I want to be there because Jesus is going to be there. And there's a special presence of Christ. And it's like, okay, good, good. So my whole job is to become less and less and less while he increases and increases and increases. And the hope is one day it's just going to be all about him. And everyone is thrilled about the presence of Christ. And so last week we talked about reverence at the table. And uh, today I want to talk about intimacy at the table. Okay, this is, this is the thrill of communing with God. I, I, I want to read a... There's so many passages in my head. Um, yeah, let me just start with 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. It says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake the one bread. Okay, I've been meditating on this passage this week, where he says this, this, this bread that we take, this cup that we bless. Okay, key word, we. This cup that we bless. This is, this is, this is such a fascinating truth. Um, I just want to share with you, and I hope it's not old to you, but this morning, God in heaven wants, okay, wants, he desires, God, sitting on his throne, almighty God, who spoke the earth into existence. I hope this is still great news to you. He wants to commune with us. Keyword, us. Not you. Yes, you, but even more so us. That's why the church comes together. This is God's desire. Now, I came here. I was here like 7 a.m. God and I were communing together just in this room. He and I, that was good. He liked it. I liked it. But what he wants more when I study the New Testament is he wants us. He wants us united as one coming before the body and blood of the Lord, and he wants to commune with us in a special way. 
This is not just a passive event here. That's why he says in that verse, he says that, that the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Okay? There's somehow, through communion, we participate. Okay, that's not just a, a, a cup that's out there and we're over here. Somehow we participate in the blood of Christ. And I was looking at that word participate. That word participate is actually the word koinonia, where we get fellowship. So participate almost feels a little bit stiff. Because the word koinonia, listen to this. The word koinonia can actually be translated intercourse. It is talking about a serious intermingling with Christ and us at the table. This is not a ritual. This is our participation in the blood of Christ. We are participants. And God is saying, I want to abide in you, plural. I want to fellowship with you. I want my blood to be mingled with yours. I want my flesh to be your flesh. And that's why he says, the cup of blessing we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake the one bread. He wants all of us that came from different situations, different parts of the world, different backgrounds. He wants us all partaking with him by taking of one bread, one cup, in participation with him. This is what God desires. That's, that's amazing to me that it's his desire. Okay, how many of you are control freaks? Just raise your hands. Let me see. I want to just make sure some of you. Okay. You don't think you are? No? Okay. All right. I don't know. I kind of think you are. Okay. But uh, um, I, I, I tend to be a control freak. Um, and and it, it really messes up my worship sometimes. Um, because I come in here and I want to control the room. I want to make you desire God. Okay, some of you guys came in here, you're a little groggy, you know, just kind of passively, whatever, and I want to fix that. I want to change it. I'm like, no, I'm going to make you desire him, you know, and so every time I teach, I'm trying to control the room and, and, and make you want God, and then I even try to control God sometimes where I go, God, there's people that are going to come in that room, and they're coming in passively. Would you make them desire you? So I'm, I'm begging you, come on, man, this is God. We can, we can have an intimacy with God, our creator. We were made for this. We were made in his image, the image of a triune God, so that somehow we could be one with him. And so, so I'm like begging, come on, you guys, we can be one with God. And then I'm on my knees this morning begging God, God, please come down in that room. Would you do something? Would you just wake up people that don't get who you are? And so from both ends, I'm just begging, 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 begging. Because I want to control it. But the Lord was reminding me of one of my favorite passages. Um, in fact, I have a, there's a painting in my house, in my living room, uh, over this passage. It's, 
It's, it's Luke chapter 8. And it's about this woman in Luke 8, verse 49. It says, There was a woman who had a dis, I'm sorry, 43, who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. For I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I love that story, and I seriously have this painting in my living room because I, I, I saw it in Israel one time, and, and, uh, and, and it was just, you see the hand, you just see this hand reaching amidst a crowd, just going to touch Jesus. And it, it reminds me, you know, like the disciples are going, what, what do you mean someone touched you? Everyone touched you, and Jesus, no. But everyone's crowding in on Jesus. Everyone's trying to just get a little bit of Jesus. And, and Jesus, no, no, someone here was different. There was a faith, and I felt the power go out from me. So there's, there's part of me that I'm trying to control everything and go, no, I want everyone in here to experience God. Even some of you who don't even know if you really believe him, I just want to, I want them to make it happen. And there are times in scripture when it seems like God hits someone out of nowhere. Um, there is that time like when Elisha, the prophet, is like, God, would you open the eyes of my servant? And suddenly the servant's eyes are open and he sees all these, you know, chariots with fire and angels. And, he, and I'm thinking, wow, he was just standing there. And Elisha prayed for him. And so I pray that prayer. You know, I go, God, some of these people think that you're just a religion or just someone they grew up with. They don't see you. Open their eyes. And I believe there are times that that, that happens. But most of the time in Scripture, it's about they will seek me and find me when they search for me with all of their hearts. So there were a bunch of people pressing into Jesus, but there was one person that was so desperate and said, I've got to get to him, and Jesus knew it. And that's where I have to just let go of my control freak attitude and just realize not everyone's going to experience Jesus this morning. Not everyone's really going to touch him. Because I can't make you desire. And so the question I have for you today is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how desperately did you come today wanting communion with Jesus? Think about the story about that woman. Sounds like she was a 10. And I don't know where everyone else was. But I want you to think. In your heart, as you walked into this room this morning, how desperate were you to have communion with God? to be intimate with him? How much expectation did you have coming in here today? Were you fascinated thinking, this is it? 
This is better than me being alone in a room with the Lord. This is that opportunity at the presence of Christ with brothers and sisters that are like striving after him together. And, and it's not just us wanting it. It is God himself wanting this. He desires this, just like he told his disciples. Once they got in that, that upper room with the, with the elements, you know, he says to them, oh, I have so desired this time with you. He's like, I wanted this supper with you. He says, Jesus says to disciples, I can't wait. I couldn't wait for this moment. But what's interesting is, some of you guys know, I've just been so blown away by John uh, chapters 13 to 17. You know, Jesus' last words to his disciples. And I, I just keep going, gosh. Look at what he says. I can't imagine sitting in that room, having him wash my feet, you know, tell me about how, how, how the this, this Spirit is going to come and that he's going to manifest himself to me and that, that he's not going to leave me like an orphan, but he's going to this place to be with his Father and that I can ask him for anything. I just imagine sitting in that room I'm going, are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Like, so he's with us and he's going to be in us. And, and you're preparing a place with all these rooms and you're promising me that you're going to come back. But it's interesting, if you read the narrative in John 13, there's a point when it says Judas leaves. Right? He goes to betray Jesus. And then comes John 14 to 17. And I look at that, I go, oh, he missed it. He missed the most beautiful words a human being could hear from his creator. His desire for oneness with them. See, not everyone got to be in that upper room with Jesus. I was thinking about uh, this week, I was thinking, or last week, I was thinking about the transfiguration. Remember in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up to a mountaintop, and suddenly Jesus starts beaming like the sun. And then Moses and Elijah come down from heaven, and, and Peter and James and John are just looking, what in the world? Look at him, he's glowing, his face is like the sun, and Peter's like, just, just stay here, just stay here, I'll, I'll, I'll put a tent up. Uh, okay, should we just, should I put up three tents? Hey, let's just all hang out here together. Let's hang out here, just stay here. And I thought, gosh, if I was Peter, or James, or John, what would go through my head? Ah, oh, maybe not, maybe I'd be so freaked out, I <laughs> But I was thinking about how I tend to be a person that thinks about the people who missed it. Like, oh, I wish my wife was here. Ah, oh, one of my daughters isn't here. Uh, you know, I think if I'm Peter, I'm like, oh, man, I wish Philip could see this. He would have loved this. You know, like you're, you're, you're thinking about other people. But the truth was, I, I kept trying to figure out, God, why did you just invite those three? And the Bible doesn't make it clear. It seems like there was a unique relationship with those three, but we don't know. Whatever you think, is, it's a guess. All I know is it was just those three. It was just those 11. It was just the 120 in the upper room. There were times when some people got to experience a more intense deeper intimacy with Christ, a revealing of Christ, just like that one woman got to experience amidst a crowd. But how badly do you want this?
Last week we talked about what it would be like to walk into the Holy of Holies. Remember that? We looked at Leviticus 16 and thought a high priest walking into the Holy of Holies and then seeing a cloud form over the ark and then the presence of God being upon that ark and now you as a human being are in the same room as God. And we tried to imagine that, right? God, what would I feel? And then we talked about the book of Hebrews and how the book of Hebrews does not say, wow, it was great back then and we're just gonna experience a little shadow of that. But it says the opposite. Like that was the copy, that was the shadow of what we could experience now. But as you came today, as you, you know, I want us to just examine our hearts right now. Do we have faith? Do you have faith like that woman? And, and God says to her, your faith, daughter, your faith has made you well. You came and you, you knew you could touch me. You knew that power would come from me. Like there was a faith that was involved. Like did you come this morning thinking in faith that something invisible was literally going to happen? Going, God, I have to have this, my spirit, my inner person. Okay, no, we don't have a, you know, Jesus in his flesh and us in our flesh touching him, but, but maybe we do. There's something going on here. But what we do know is spiritually, we were made in the image of God and Somehow my spirit and his spirit can be one. And he wants to abide in us, in us. Remember, it says that we, we are God's singular temple and that God dwells in us us. The imagery of the New Testament is all of us are living stones. Okay, each of you is a stone, a living stone. And we are supposed to come together as individual stones and build one temple. And just like in the Old Testament, when they had finished the temple, Solomon prays, and God goes into the temple. That's what today is about. It's about all of us came as individuals. And we're saying, God, make us one temple. Because we want you to be in our midst. And we want to not just eat a piece of bread and drink from a cup. We want to participate. We want to fellowship. We want to have a union with your blood and your flesh. And that's why we come to become one. And there's an excitement about that. What was that song we sing? We welcome you with praise. <laughs> um, it's this idea of welcoming God himself. Okay, I confess, for many years I was, maybe obsessed is a too strong of a word, but I was very, very concerned about how many people showed up at church gatherings that I led. 
Like if the room wasn't completely full and the overflow wasn't full and the, you know, the video room wasn't full. Like I wanted to know how many people were there at every single service. And I was very concerned with keeping people there. You know, I didn't see this person's face. I didn't see that person's face. Where'd that guy go? I know she was getting mad and she finally leave. You know, you, you, it, it's just, I'm sorry, I, there's still some of that stuck in there. But what that does is you're so focused on other people's presence that you don't think about the presence of Christ. You don't think about how in Ezekiel 10, how the spirit of the Lord left the temple. And it seems to kind of hover over that east gate like, ah, oh, and then leaves. You forget about Jesus. You, go, you know what? I'm just leaving this place. It's his presence. We're here to minister to him. I want us to be like Peter at that transfiguration going, stay right here. Let me build a place for you. I don't want you to go anywhere. Please, please, let me build a, okay, Moses, I'll, I'll build one for Moses and Elijah. Let's just, let's just all stay right here because this is ridiculous. Is that the desire of your heart right now to say, Jesus, we welcome you into this place. And I want, I am desperate. I did not come here to hear someone teach. I didn't come here to just sing some songs. I mean, if we came here just to hear a message, we could have done that online. But we came to participate in the blood and body of Jesus. We came here to form a temple of living stones with the hope that his spirit would inhabit us and that we would have this intimate, deep time in the presence of Christ. How badly do you want it right now? You guys, I've been looking forward to this time. I've had good times with the Lord all week, but I've been looking forward to this because this is different. There is something about the way that God wants us. That is the New Testament. He wants his church. He wants his bride. He doesn't just want individual Christians. He wants the church together in unity at his table. And it's there that he's going to meet with us. And my prayer is that we grow in this fascination of this time. And again, I don't want to ever forget the warnings that if anyone eats or drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have died. Okay, let's remember what we talked about last week. There is a real possibility of death just as there was when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. There's a real chance of that, and it was terrifying. That's what also made it thrilling and fascinating. God and man in one place. That is crazy. And now he's talking about a fellowship, participation, with his blood and his body. And that's why he says, you better examine yourself before you eat of the bread or drink of the cup. 
Let a man examine himself before he eats the bread or drinks the cup. Make sure you recognize the body of the Lord. Make sure you look around this room and recognize this is the body of the Lord. We don't want to go in there with division. You know, make sure you've confessed, God, anyone. You know, I, I, I just, even this week, I'm going, God, is there anything like that in me? Where am I still bugged at this person or this person or this person? I, I need it out of me, God, because I'm going to enter into your presence. And I've got to have your presence. This is what I live for, for my soul to be one with the spirit of the living God. And so this is a special time, a real special time, a real intimate time where his bride comes together and unites with the groom who is the head of this body. And somehow we participate in the blood of Christ and in his body. And so, again, I don't want to rush into this, this intimate time. I want us to come with expectation, anticipation, fascination, desperation. Like, God, I want this. I want my spirit to be one with you. I want my blood, my flesh that you created to be one with your flesh and blood. Somehow, however that mysteriously happens, I don't know. And I'm not going to try to define it. I'm just going to look at it as a mystery and tell God I want this. And so I want to give you some time to uh, prepare for this. Um, you could sing a couple songs, or maybe you're not supposed to sing during this time, but you just get things right with the Lord, get things right with anyone in this room that maybe you don't feel right, right about, confess any bitterness, confess any complacency, and, and let's try to be like that woman in Luke 8 and say, Jesus, I've got to touch you this morning. I want this. I am desperate for this more than anything. And if you need to pray with someone um, beforehand, be, because maybe you want to confess your sins to someone, or you just feel like something's not right in my walk with the Lord, and I, I need some prayer. Um, if I could have a couple of the leaders just kind of come up right now and, and stand with me. A couple of the elders, maybe some elders' wives, or that'd be great. So, yeah, if you need prayer, come on up and pray with us. But let's let's just prepare our hearts for this moment that we are going to have with Jesus. You guys can just keep on praying for each other. If you need prayer, keep coming. I'm going to pray a blessing over the bread and over the cup. But I want you to pray it with me. Because 1 Corinthians 10 says that that cup that we bless and that bread that we bless that I want us to be in agreement, saying, God, we, we want everything, everything we can have right now. And if that means this turns into your flesh and blood and intermingles with ours, we want that. And if it means there's something spiritual, sim symbolic that we, we don't see, we want that. We just want a deep communion with you. So let's bless the cup and the bread. Father from heaven, we 
we pray over these elements and we give thanks to you. And God, I ask that you do, we ask that you do whatever you want to that bread and that cup. However you and your eternal perfect mind see best. We're just saying we want as much of you as we can have, Lord. The things of this world, everything is nothing compared to union with you. This is what we were made for. We were made to be one with you. We have to touch you. We have to have this oneness with you. We want this more than anything, God. And we've assembled together as your body, seeing you as our head. We've come together as your bride, saying, come, Lord Jesus. Come, our bridegroom. We want to be with you. Fellowship with you. Participate in your blood and your body. We want perfect oneness. So I pray for all of the bread that's in this room and all of the cups that are in this room, Lord. May you bless it from heaven. We want your blessing. We want your presence. We don't ever want you to leave us. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. And he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And he had all of his disciples drink of it. We have uh, stations in the back there and, and on the other, in the four corners, basically. Just go grab a, a cup and a piece of the bread. And for those who are visiting, we encourage you, if you have not, we strongly encourage you, uh, beg you, if you have not decided to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you are not sure that he really died on that cross for you and shed his blood for you, then please do not take of this. We're so glad you are here. This is like the perfect thing for you to be a part of, to observe. Because Jesus says, this is the way the believers were supposed to proclaim his death until he returned. It wasn't with a fancy sermon. Jesus says, have other people watch as you break a piece of bread and remind them that this represents the body of Jesus, his flesh that was torn which represented the curtain to the Holy of Holies torn open so that we could have access to God. And he says this cup will remind us of his blood that was shed. Just like in the Old Testament where they would shed the, the blood of bulls and rams. And it was to show that a price had to be paid for the things that we did wrong. We needed to be atoned for. And now he says, here's the ultimate sacrifice. My body and my blood broken for you. And so if you're visiting and didn't understand that, maybe you never knew that at death we were all going to face God. The Bible says it's appointed for every man to die once and then comes judgment. He is the coming judge. And 
most of us here in this room, we've gathered not because we think we're good people and deserve this. It's because we're not good people and we need this. We're saying, God, I can't come into your presence, not with the garbage that is, has filled my life. I need forgiveness. And that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He took our sin on the cross. And he paid for it by the breaking of his body and the spilling of his blood. And then he rose from the dead. And he says to us in this room, any of you who believes in me, you won't perish, but you have eternal life because of this. And we believe that Jesus is in here because he rose from the dead and his desire is intimacy with us. So as a church, we are going to participate fellowship with his very body. So if you take the bread, then we, as the body of Christ, get to celebrate and enjoy this special moment. Let's take and eat and fellowship with his flesh. And now take the cup that we blessed and that God blessed from heaven. And let's participate in the blood of Christ. 